Good morning. Uh, yeah, so I'm Victor. I'm going to talk about the dynamics of NFT platforms alone. Uh, talk to you in Spanish later. Work done with my colleagues uh, from Amsterdam, Fly University at Amsterdam, and one of them is now at uh, Microsoft. So the takeaway message of today is that in the past 10 years, when it comes to code reuse, um, we've been looking at only one way, basically, when it comes to gadget finding. If we want to look for gadgets in a binary, we are using almost always static analysis. This talk today will be about using dynamic analysis instead. Um, in our work, we compare four classes of defenses using now dynamic analysis. Uh, we look at control flow integrity, information hiding, re-randomization, and pointer integrity. And we develop a system, and we show that with our system, we can break the state-of-the-art defenses. So a little bit about static flash on the bone. Um, uh, Shaham's uh, paper 10 years ago at CCS. Um, the paper described uh, return to libc without using function calls. And what Shaham was doing, he was uh, combining short instruction gadgets and then chaining them together to craft an exploit chain. And this work was really the first systematic formulation of code reuse attacks. And now we all know this as return-oriented programming. Um, the paper has been highly influential with around 900 citations right now. And yesterday you won CCS 2017 Test of Time Award. Um, if we talk about the impact of this work is that still today, uh, this paper shaped how we think about code reuse attacks. Um, we're analyzing the so-called geometry of a binary to locate gadgets and then chain these to graph an exploit. And the work has initiated a lot of uh, research, uh, attackers and defenders both developing onwards uh, this, this original return-oriented programming, and almost an arm uh, race started. Um, however, during this race, the model never changed. Um, we're still discovering gadgets by using static analysis. Um, so quickly, the threat model in our work. Um, we're going to assume a strong baseline where we have ASLR, depth, and so a non-executable stack. We have coarse grain CFI, meaning that we can only target uh, functions. And we have a perfect shadow stack. We are, so we're not looking at classic ROP attacks anymore. Um, and then we assume an attacker was quite strong. He has an arbitrary memory retried primitive, uh, access to the binary, and the goal of this attacker is to divert control flow. So he's not going to look at data only attacks. Um, a little bit more about this arms trace. So, what have we been seeing the last decade? Um, we had an attacker who would analyze a program. So, we have a program here with some gadgets. Um, the attacker would statically analyze the binary, find some gadgets that are interesting. Uh, change them together, and publish a nice paper. Then, three months later, or maybe a year, at the same conference, we would have a defender um, looking at the gadgets the attacker was using, and then inventing a way to restrict access to these gadgets. So they're no longer, uh, the attacker can no longer use them. And then we publish another paper. Um, and then there's a feedback loop, where now the attacker looks at the binary again, looks at the gadgets that are left, still identify some of those, change another get, uh, uh, exploit together, and writes another paper. And then the defender comes, removing those gadgets. Um, all these years, the mindset of the defenders, which, is, which are ours, the, the academics, um, has, has been the same. Um, we've been working on control flow integrity uh, defenses, so constraining control flow. We have been looking at uh, new ways of re randomizing code and data. We've been working on enforcing pointer integrity defenses. Um, and currently, the state of the art is that not many gadgets are left in this binary. So we started with millions, we went to thousands, and now there are a couple <coughs> dozens left, perhaps. And the remaining gadgets are hard to find. So right now, I think it's a uh, valid thing to say that code reuse, crafting code reuse attacks is uh, quite hard. However, if we look at the mindset of the attacker, which is the real world, um, then it's important to note that the attacker does not care about gadgets or up chains or true completeness. And basically what the attacker wants is 
to call XXV or Amprotect, or maybe another system call uh, with some arguments that he can control so that he can actually do whatever you want. And they have no reason to limit themselves to using static analysis. And basically, the question that the attacker should answer is what memory values that I have control over should I modify to get control over the binary? Um, so what we have to do, I think, is change the model. And we are going to do this in this work. We're going to model this with dynamic taint analysis. Um, so dynamic analysis, what memory values should I modify to gain control? How do we figure this out? A couple steps. We start with getting the binary that we're looking at into a certain quiescent state. I'll talk about this more later. Um, and then in the state, the binary is sort of stable, not doing much when it comes to the attacker. And we taint all the memory that the attacker can control. Um, next, we're going to interact with the program, and we're going to monitor branches. And these are taint sinks um, that depend on the memory that we have taint. And this will give us calls at targets and arguments. And then for each sink, so each indirect call site we will hit, we will dump that source. So what memory value uh, tainted this specific call site? And this answers the questions that the, that the attacker is looking for. What memory values do I have to modify to change whatever is happening in the binary? With this in place, we can now also model code reuse defenses, a lot of different code reuse defenses into, uh, into one system. Looking at what memory values can I modify, um, an arbitrary memory write basically gives you access to anything. So you can modify anything in data memory. You can modify code pointers, data pointers, and other values, integers or characters or whatever. However, if you deploy a certain defense, um, you may limit the capabilities to, of the attacker, of what you can corrupt. For example, uh, code pointer integrity will tell you that you can no longer modify any of these pointers. So a defense like this is applying a sort of write constraint. It is telling the attacker that it cannot write anything but only a subset. Uh, on the other hand, the attacker is asking the question, what can I target? So if I have control over a call site, what functions in memory can I still access? Um, we have an arbitrary memory read. So the baseline is that we can access any function in code memory, uh, anything in target binary, anything in libc usually, and any other module that is loaded. However, certain defenses may limit what we can target. So, for example, control flow integrity will tell you that certain call site can only limit, can only target a limited set of functions. This is what we call target constraints. And now we can uh, describe our system. We call it Newton. Um, it's an automatic gadget finding tool. It uses dynamic analysis. And it's a, this is a simplified uh, illustration of the Newton pipeline. So, with a binary, we apply some static analysis, we apply dynamic analysis, and then we get Newton gadgets. And during the analysis phases, we uh, we push the we feed the constraints of certain defenses into the system, and then we get Newton gadgets. And Newton gadget is basically saying call site X is tainted by address one two three four in memory and may call functions A B or C. So let's look at how this works in practice. So I have a couple of examples that I want to try to go over. It uh, starts with the baseline. Uh, that we have no target constraints and we have no write constraints. This is just to illustrate how the dynamic change analysis works. Um, we're starting up NGINX and then we're going to connect to it um, and then we'll look at what happened during this time. Um, in this scenario we have a configuration structure that's being allocated on the heap and in this configuration structure there's a handler code pointer pointing to a function in the NGINX text uh, space code. And now we say we enter this quiescent state, um, meaning that the server now is stable um, for the attacker's perspective. It might be actually serving a lot of other requests in parallel to other uh, users that are currently interacting with it, but for the attacker it's stable. We reach its state after a minimal set of interactions, and currently for the attacker there's only now long-lived data in memory. So we're going to taint all memory. We're going to tell our system to taint everything that's currently in memory. So we color it. Um, then we're going to monitor indirect calls. And we're going to interact with the binary. We're going to send uh, a GET request over the connection that we just opened. Um, what happens 
if you do this on Nginx, is that there will be an allocation for a request buffer. And this request buffer has a code pointer. And this code pointer is copied from the configuration uh, code pointer that we just saw. So there's a copy going on there. The configuration uh, uh, buffer was tainted. So this code pointer is now also tainted. And later in execution, we see that this code pointer is actually being executed. And now Newton will report that this code pointer is tainted by the certain configuration uh, field in the configuration structure. And there's something that the attacker can control. So going back to this question state, where we now can apply an arbitrary memory retry primitive. Um, how is the attacker going to uh, exploit this? Basically, change the code pointer in the configuration structure to point to another function. Let's point it to system. Then we send the get request. And then when the actual HTTP request is being allocated, the copy happens. And now this code pointer in the request uh, buffer is also pointing to system. So when this gets invoked, um, the program is calling system. Let's look at the second scenario, where we have baseline, but now we're also going to apply first defense, execute, not read. It's a generic class of defenses, and what they give you in our situation is that it changes the target constraints. So with, if you have execute, not read defenses in place, you can no longer access the code pages, ideal implementation. Um, and what you can still do is target live code pointers that are currently in memory. Um, XNR doesn't give you any write constraints, so this doesn't change anything. So let's go back into squares and state, um, where we are going to train on memory and then monitor in direct calls. But now first, we have to do another step where we get all the live code pointers that are currently in memory. This means scanning all the data memory for code pointers. And if you do this, um, you will see that there are actually a lot of those. They are in data sections, they are in the heap, they are on the stack, they are uh, global offset tables. And typical Nginx run already gives you several, over 750 of these live code pointers, including and protect. So if you want to bypass now um, the baseline plus XNR, instead of making the handler in the configuration structure point to uh, system, which we don't know the address of now, we can make it point to and protect. Because and protect is live in data memory, we know where it is located. And then we send the get request, the copy uh, happens again, and now when this function is being uh, invoked, it's actually calling and protect. The third scenario I want to discuss is XNR, the previous scenario, but now also adding cryptographic CFI, CCFI. Target constraints will remain the same, except now we also have a write constraint that tells you we can corrupt everything in memory except code pointers. So the previous attack won't work because we are corrupting a code pointer. So let's go back to see what happens when we start up Nginx. Um, because there's more going on than just this configuration structure, uh, something else that's being allocated is a listening structure. And this listening structure has a handler to a code pointer. This listening structure has a code pointer to somewhere in the Nginx code space. There's another allocation on the heap, which is a connection structure. And this connection structure has a data pointer pointing to the listening structure. Then we reach the question state. So now we're going to tell Newton to get us, give us all the live code pointers so we get it protect. We're going to taint all memory. Um, but we're also now going to wash the taint, remove all the taint, from all the code pointers, because we can no longer control these as an attacker. So they are removed. Then we're going to monitor indirect calls, and we send the get request. And in this scenario, we see that this code pointer in the listening structure is being invoked by dereferencing the connection structure uh, using the data pointer in there. So Newton will give us that this handler, this code pointer there, is still tainted by the certain uh, data pointer that is in, me in memory that we can still control because CCFI doesn't uh, give you any guarantees on this. So to bypass this, um, we're going to construct in the heap memory a counterfeit listening structure. And we're going to place it just there where the, uh, the mProtect code pointer is. Then we're going to corrupt the data pointer in the uh, connection structure to 
make it point to our counterfeit object. And then when we set the get request and this code pointer is being invoked, we are actually uh, diverting control flow again to Ampersand. Um, the final scenario I wanted to discuss is the baseline defense plus XNR plus uh, CPI. And then we're looking at the uh, reference implementation of CPI. Um, target constraints are the same. Um, we can still corrupt everything in memory except code pointers, but also no longer data pointers. So code pointer technically, it's in its name. Um, we can no longer corrupt any code pointer. So we start up NGINX. Um, let's see what else happens. And there's this ops uh, structure on the heap. And there's another structure. It's uh, a variable. It's a key variable array. And this array, uh, as we will see, so this ops uh, structure has a data field that is an integer. It's set to zero. And then this, uh, this array of variables have a couple of code pointers in them. So every element in this array has a code pointer. And these are all initialized when you connect to Nginx. So we enter the queries in state. And we're going to tell Newton to give us all the live code pointers. So we get m protect. We're going to taint all memory. And we're going to wash code pointer taint. So these are no longer tainted. We're going to wash all data pointers now, except in this case, there are, on, there are no data pointers. And then we're going to monitor indirect calls. We set the get request. And Newton will tell us that uh, whenever um, one of these handler functions of the variables is being executed, they are still tainted by this uh, integer value in the, in the ops structure. So to bypass this, um, we can override the data field in this ops structure. If we set it to three, we're moving the variable uh, further towards and protect in memory. If we set it to four, we're getting closer. And if we uh, set the ops value to five, we're now targeting and protect. So we set the get request. Um, the program will try to execute, uh, to call actually and protect in this case. All right, so this is Newton in practice. Uh, a couple of examples that show you how easy it is to craft uh, code reuse exploits with our system. Um, we only looked at controlling the code pointer, but you can use the same mechanics to also look at what arguments are being taken. Um, we use this in our work to model uh, 30 defenses. So here they are. And we reduce this to eight different types of target constraints and only three right constraints. And once we did this, we plotted these into a nice scatter plot where on the x, uh, you have right constraints. On the y, you have target constraints. And now you can actually see some interesting results because you can uh, identify equivalence classes. Uh, so in this example, CCFI, uh, cryptographic CFI, protecting code pointers, is giving you the same guarantees as CPS, but it's also giving you the same guarantees as TASR, timely address spacing randomization. Um, we evaluated this. So for example, looking at how many call sites we can control in Nginx, um, without any constraints, we can control 35 of these. If we apply the code pointer constraint, we can still control 13, if we comply also data pointer constraints, we can only control eight. And then we have a separate write constraint that I didn't discuss now. It's for bypassing context sensitive CFI, um, which we modeled as a specific write constraint. And even in this scenario, we can still control two uh, call signs. And we showed it in the paper that one of these is actually enough. Um, this is with minimal coverage. So we are using dynamic analysis now, so we're bound to the coverage of our system. and um, we're only sending one get request. So if you set more get requests, you get better coverage and you get probably more code pointers that you can still control. We also looked at the targets. Uh, what, can we talk, what can we still call? So for Nginx, if we have uh, no protection in place, there are 4,500 functions in memory. If we have this light, uh, the live code pointer constraint, they're saying only targeting what is live in memory, we are at 750. And then we also looked at, for example, source level CFI, where this number is much more, uh, much further reduced. Um, okay. Then we looked at other servers. 
um, they basically show the same results. So we have, if we add nginx results in here, we can see that the number of tainted call sites for Apache sort of matches the ones in nginx. Um, for Redis, the, the number of targets is also in the same order. So in conclusion, uh, 10 years of code reuse, the, we know now that Kraken code reuse attacks is hard. Um, however, we always been, have been using static analysis. And with Newton, we show that if we consider the dynamics of a binary, of a program, um, we will still find leeway for an attacker to craft new exploits. And we can actually use the gadgets that are reported by Newton to compare different defenses with each other. Um, so if it comes to the next 10 years of code reuse, um, to protect against these types of attacks, we should look at combining state-of-the-art defenses, extending, for example, uh, as suggested by the CPI authors, uh, CPI with bounds checking, um, and reducing or and or reducing overhead of more heavyweight defenses. Um, that's it for now. Um, you can find more. You can find a video of our one of our attacks on our project page. And I'm, of course, happy to answer any question. Thank you. Uh, nice work. This is Hong from uh, Georgia Tech. <clears throat> uh, I think the reason this uh, attack works is uh, current CFI has a different assumption as your date. Uh, the current CF CFI and the CPI, they assume they protect the control data and also even the pointer of control data. So actually for the CPI attack, you're going to attack an uh, index of an array, which is commonly believed is not a control data, but it's quite related to control data. I think the reason attack work is uh, currently the boundary between control data and non-control data is getting blurred. Um, so it's hard to say whether we still have control data attack or not, but definitely next we can have a lot of uh, uh, non-control data attacks. Okay, so this is a simple comment. All right. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so it's, uh, I agree. Um, so we are still diverting control flow. So in this case, I think it should count as a uh, uh, control flow uh, diversion attack. Um, so it, the, I think the index in this case should be part of the control data, I think. Okay, uh, the real question is, uh, do you consider the address randomization? Sorry? Do you consider address randomization, like an ASR, to, to build attacks here? I'm not sure I understand. Address randomization. Randomization? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the, in the baseline. Um, but we also assume the arbitrary memory read. So the baseline ASLR is easily bypassed uh, by that way. Uh, but many of the other uh, defenses we looked at also include randomization. Yes. Uh, OK, cool. Nice work, okay. All right. Hi there. Uh, nice work overall. I liked it. Um, disclaimer here, I'm one of the authors of CPI. And we've, we've discussed this before, right? So this is a, an interesting issue you found with the reference implementation of CPI. But it's uh, in the paper, we actually talk about doing bounce checks for anything that is triggered sensitive. And uh, apparently, as we checked in the code, yes, that's your. Backup slide. There is yes. a. Yeah, in the paper you have a. Or, well, we got an email uh, recently from the CPI authors that CPI does soft bound style uh, bound checking. Um, but it was fairly recently. So, the paper's already out. Um, uh, we looked at this, of course, once we, once we got this uh, email. Uh, the paper is not very explicit about this. But. Um, um, so, of course, we tried the implementation and we found that this is still work. Uh, but we're looking at this and we will update the paper if necessary. Um, so, so, one thing I can say, we, the property does bounce checking, but what you still could do is intra-object overflows. Like if you would, uh, if you look, if you'd look into, into this part, so there's still a weakness there. We do bounce checks on the individual memory objects. Or at least the property claims to do that. Modulo reference implementation bug. So there, there's still like some opportunity for, uh, for issues. Yeah. But uh, so I, I think we, we all agree that uh, combining or getting CPI with actual proper bounce right. uh, protection 
is the right way to go. Although it will occur, of course, uh, additional overhead. So it will be right, right. Uh, well, yeah, but, but it's an interesting. So this is an interesting work. opportunity to revisit this uh, this research and maybe come up with a with yes. a better, stronger, faster implementation and better static analysis. Um, the question I actually wanted to ask is uh, scalability of of your approach. And um, you've done the engine X example that has been evaluated to death in 50 plus papers. Did you look at other um, other applications? Because given the set of advanced defenses, attacks become highly program dependent and um, require a large amount of constraints. So I wanted to know if you have some general ability um, conclusions or, or how how often does it scale? How likely are you going to find gadgets um, and so on? Or wh what's the least amount of complexity in the application that you need to find some interesting <coughs> gadgets? So the, the set of servers that we analyze, they all show uh, uh, tainted call sites that we can control. Um, we didn't use a specific vulnerability for it, so we didn't use the, the Nginx uh, CVE. Uh, we just assume what all the defenses are assuming, an arbitrary read-write memory primitive. And with that in place, you can launch these attacks. Um, right, but you're, you're in that space where taint analysis, like at one point in time, taint analysis will over-taint, and you have to pick this particular quiescent state. Otherwise, uh -huh. you, you end up with everything tainted, or, or just... Right, so but the quiescent states, they are sort of a natural state, right? So it's, it's after interactions. So for a program, is very simple to understand. It's basically connecting to the server. And then uh, we assume that at that moment we have the arbitrary memory read by primitive. Um, yeah. okay. Hello, uh, my name is Ioannis Agadakos from Stevens University. Very nice work. So uh, similar to the previous uh, question, but in a slightly different way. Uh, you, and Nginx is uh, in C, right? So have you evaluated C++ uh, applications that they have way more pointers. And also, in your results, you showed that um, I think um, even though initially you had bugs in libc, you, you, you had the addresses you could exploit in libc, you, didn't, uh, you don't show any other of the libraries. And in the end, you managed to drop it to zero. Do you have any insight for uh, other, um, why, why did that happen for the libraries and not for Nginx? or how that would scale well, to other libraries? I'm not sure if I understood the last part. So, so um, if you go back to your results. Uh, uh, let's look at this one, for yeah. example. So this you is saw a, that the source types um, with uh, seven. Oh, OK, yeah. So this is, uh, I, I didn't specify this in the presentation. Um, the source types, actually all the the binary types, safe, safe source types, and source types in this table um, this is about CFI, okay. and here the results are uh, this medium. So CFI will have for every different every call set that you control, the number of targets is different. Um, so in the source types example, uh, the median of of this is is libc. So there are a couple in the paper. We also report minimum and maximum, uh, so, but the medium is zero. So that's why in this uh, example you see yeah. zero. Yeah. Uh, what was the first? About C++. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think this, in, ger in general, just should just work. Um, I think it would be nice future work to extend our research to look also at C++, uh, to look also at those defenses that specifically target C++. Uh, but in general, the approach should still be the same mm -hmm. for painting in an interactive approach. OK, thank you. Hi, I'm Laszlo Sakrash from Google. Uh, I'm the one who raised your attention to the CPI problem. Uh, just wanted to point out that uh, if you look at the CPI paper, it's pretty explicit about balance checking, so I would disagree your point there. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I okay, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so honest mistake, I guess from our side that we missed this. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're looking into it, and if the paper requires an update, it will be fixable. Great, um, thanks. 